Last week we started a new series called Engage. Everybody say Engage. And Engage, we're not necessarily talking about an engagement, like you're all lovey-dovey and all that, but in some ways it does have those uh, connectivity aspect to it. But today I want you to think about the way a train car grabs a hold of the train engine. It engages. Have you ever been by a train track and the big the, the, the locomotive or some of the trains backing up and it squeak, 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 and then it hits that car behind it and it's like boom, right? And it just rattles all the way down. And then when this train starts going forward, what happens? It engages. Some of the problems in Christianity today is we think we are the engine and not the train car. Oh my. <laughs> Some of us want to be the conductor. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker? I saw this years ago. It stuck with me. It says, God is my co-pilot. I can assure you God is not your co-pilot. Either God's driving or he's not even in the car. Amen? He ain't riding nowhere with your lousy rear end driving. God is not your co-pilot. But if you let God drive, man, the places he can take you. The things that you will see that you would have never seen if you'll just be engaged, be coupled to him and his plan. We talked last week about Jonah. You need to go back and you need to go watch it on YouTube. We talked about Jonah. And we're going to pick up in, in, in Jonah's story here in a minute. We didn't finish it. Um, but Jonah, he decided, you know, because God said, I want you to go this way. And Jonah said, ah, I have a better plan, and it involves me going that way. Anybody want to be really honest and say, I've done that? <laughs> right? Yeah, God's got this plan worked out, and it's just, it's just a freaky plan. You're just like, I just don't know about that plan. That plan kind of scares me. That's not really what I want to do. You know, it's not real comfortable. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've all been there. And that's what happened to Jonah. And, you know, God said, go, go left. He went right, right or left, whichever. He went the opposite way of what God said to do. And the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1, it says that he left the presence of God. He didn't just leave the plan of God. Because when you leave the plan of God, you also leave his presence. It's just a connected thing. We like to think that we can go do our own thing and just keep a little God in our pocket, and we can pull him out in time of need. But the truth of the matter is, when you pull your pocket out, and you're on your own plan, your pocket is empty. And many of us in this room have experienced that as well. But I want to encourage you, because no matter where you are, maybe you've gone on your own plan, maybe you've made up your plan as you go along, Maybe you're not a real planner and you've got your, you know, you've got your weekly planner out. You've got everything planned out. You've got your month. You've got your two-year goal. You've got your five. Maybe you've got your whole life planned out. And, and there's nothing really wrong with that per se as long as God can come along and change your plan and you're okay with that. Because the moment God makes a left and you go right, you can find yourself in some really serious problems. But, like Ryan said, God loves you. Can we just take another minute and just, I want you to say that to yourself, God loves me. Tell yourself that. Say, God loves me. Little old rotten me, right? <laughs> Little old Henri, mess things up, do it my way. God loves me. You know, back, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, um, the Brown brothers came through from Africa, Rodney Howard Brown and Basil Howard Brown, and uh, some revival services were happening. And uh, Rodney Howard Brown got in so much trouble for making this statement. And so I'll make it to you. So if you're, re well, this is how you know if you're religious. If this makes you mad, you're religious. Sorry. Uh, and so he said, this is what he said. He said, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do that will cause God to love you less. There's so much truth in that. And part of that, what I'm going to talk about today, because we have a misrepresentation of what love is. 
We think as long as I behave right, God's going to love me. But the moment I quit behaving is when God doesn't love me. But I, I got news for you. Now, God's not happy with your disobedience. Man, God will allow that to just run you right into the ground. But God always loves you. Just like a parent always loves a child, does not care at all for the bad behavior, will bring discipline in the child's life. And God will allow discipline in your life when you don't do the right things, what his word has said to you. But it never means he quits loving you. And what an incredible story with Jonah. So let me pick it up for you. So Jonah is there in this boat, and he's going the wrong way. And the storm comes, and the storm's, you know, it's just a mess. And so we, we talked a lot about the details last week, but just to catch you up, uh, here we are on the side of the boat, and Jonah is about to be thrown overboard because there's no way to stop the storm. And Jonah and the guys on the boat have discovered that Jonah is running away from God, and so their only course of action is to throw him into the sea. And so as we pick up the story today, here's Jonah. And, you know, some guy's got his hands and other guy's got his legs, and they're doing the old one, two, three. Can you imagine, though? I mean, this is a real deal. You know, sometimes, you know, I mean, I, I'm a big jokester, and it's easy to just look at things and think how silly that must have been. But this is a guy's life. And the Bible says that they were so concerned about that. They, they were praying, God, don't, don't, put, don't, hold, don't hold us accountable for what we're about to do. But they couldn't see any way out. And so they threw this man overboard. Wow. You know what? And there's people in your life that are just so done with you. They just want to throw you overboard. The devil, our enemy, the Bible says beware of the enemy, the devil. He's so done with you. He hopes somebody throws you overboard because he's just hoping for you to fail. Have you, have you grown up maybe in that kind of environment that someone is just expecting you to fail? They expect your demise. They don't think you're ever going to amount to anything. Man, Jonah, there he goes over the side into the deep. The end of the first chapter of Jonah, we find these words, God prepared a great fish. Wow. Now, I, I can think of better ways to be rescued <laughs> than getting eaten by a whale. You know, it wouldn't be on a list of top ways to, be, to rescue. You know, Nene, we throw her overboard because she's been ornery. You know, I'm sure we could think of, I'm sure she would think, man, this is the worst possible way. I mean, I'm glad they're rescuing me. But you got to see that, you got to see what God sees. This is the things we talked about last week. Uh, we're talking about things that cause us to disengage. Things that cause us to get on the boat going the wrong way. And for Jonah, it was short-sightedness. He couldn't see he couldn't see beyond the end of his nose. And so often in our life, we want to do our own thing because we can't see the bigger picture. All we see is, is the situation right in front of us, and we just can't see down the road. But man, God is, somebody say, God's always got a plan. And here's the cool thing. Even when you reject his plan, he's also got a plan. He's got a plan for your rejection of his plan. My friend, Pastor Bob Schaefer, he says, you've never disappointed God. And the first time I heard him say that, he was praying with me. He said that to me, and I thought, oh, yes, I have. i got a whole list of times I disappointed God, right? And then he said, he said because if you've disappointed God, it means you caught God by surprise, like he didn't know you were going to do that. But you've never, you've never disappointed God. Every time he, that you did the wrong thing, he knew you were going to do the wrong thing. That's why the Bible says that for every temptation comes your way, has already made a way of escape. He's, he already knew you were going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing with the wrong people. But in the middle of that, he already prepared an exit door. Hallelujah. Amen. Why? Because he loves you. He just simply loves you. So, man, Jonah, can you picture him? You know, he's not, he doesn't have his bathing trunks on. He's probably got this giant robe, a turban, I don't know, but that's probably not going to do real well, you know, in a storm. Not that many of us can really swim that well in a storm, but here he is. He's about to sink, and as he starts to go under, God's provision scoops him up. Wow. The Bible says that for three days and three nights, he was in the belly of a well. Now, you know, science will tell you that's impossible. There's no way that could happen. There's probably many of you in this room that are really like, I, you know, that's a, great, that's a great fable. 
But what if it's true? You see, in the Bible, there's plenty of stories where the Bible says, it says something that uses the word parable, which is a like and as story. It didn't really happen, but it, what it did, you know, what can we learn from it? But this is a real man named Jonah with a real town called Nineveh, a real ship that was bound for Tarshish, a real situation, real sailors, and this man went overboard, and in the depth of the sea, God provided a way out. This is not a story of judgment. This is a story of God's love. This is a story of how much our Savior loves us. When we thumbed our nose at Him, is that a thing? I'm saying that sometimes you say words out loud and you're like, what does that even mean? No, that's not a thing, is it? Yeah, yeah. Thank goodness, because that's like, anyway, when you turn, when you snub your nose, anyway, when you say, no, God, I'm going my own way, God's like, okay, I, I'm right here with you, though. I still love you. So what are things, though, that put us in that situation? What are things, that's what I want to share with you. I got three or four of them I want to talk to you about. Things that, if, that maybe, maybe, maybe if you could learn from someone else's mistake. Maybe there's something I'll say today that you'd be like, man, I am fixing to be disengaged from God. Because while this is an amazing story, all he had to do was get a ticket going the right direction, and he wouldn't have had to be in the belly of a well for three days. Right? If you want to read some scary stuff, read Jonah chapter 2. It's when he's in the belly of the well, and he's crying out from the depth. When he talks about the well, deep, diving down deep to the mountains in the bottom of the ocean. And the, you know, can you imagine the pressure that his body had to feel? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me, let, me give you, let me give you a couple of these. Last week, one of the ones we talked about was short-sightedness. This one I want to talk to you today about is offense. This is a thing that will cause you to become disengaged from the plan of God. Next week, we're going to talk about what it is to be engaged and what that looks like and the, and the glory that can happen and, and the purpose that your life can have. But first of all, we've got to talk about some things that will cause, cause you to be disengaged. And the second one on the list of five is, is uh, offense. Somebody, somebody has made me mad. I've seen more churches split over somebody made somebody mad. They told somebody else and somebody else heard that. And before you know it, the whole church is disengaged because of offense. You know, and the whole time, God is like, forgive. And we're like, oh, but you don't know what they did. Let, let, let's, just, let's just make, the, make the, 11, the, the playing field level. Everyone in this room has been offended. You are not unique. And if you've never been offended, or you think you haven't, let me tell you something. You just hang on. Somebody will make you mad, right? And what you do at that juncture will determine... Whether you stay engaged with God's plan or you make up your own plan. Offense. Wounded. Being wounded. Misunderstood. That's what we like to call it. We just misunderstood each other. But I don't want to ever see them again. <laughs> they hurt my feelings, but I wish they were dead. That kind of thing. Yeah. That's not, that's not the plan of God. So when you are offended and you don't forgive, you give the offender control of your life. When you are offended and you don't forgive, you give the person that offended you, you give them control of your life. Now, I don't know about you, Johnny, but if you made me mad, I'm sure not going to then give you the keys to everything I own. But that's exactly what happens. When we're offended, we give them control of our life. They then have the ability to make us happy or sad, what they do. That's not the way we're supposed to live. How, how, well, Gary, what do you mean I'm disconnected from God? Well, it's because you're connected to them. You're connected to the offense. If you're a train car, you only got one coupler. You can't be connected to this and connected to that. That's a double-minded train, and that ain't going nowhere, right? You can't have something pulling this way and something pulling that way. It doesn't work that way. You cannot, be, you cannot let yourself stay offended. Let me give you some things that forgiveness does. Forgiveness frees you from the control of the offense and the offender. Forgiveness frees you from the control of the offense and the offender. Forgiveness is not approval of bad behavior. Say that with me. Say, forgiveness is not approval of bad behavior. See, sometimes we get all mixed up. We're like, well, I can't forgive them. You just don't know what they did. It doesn't really matter what they did. Because if you don't forgive them, you're connected to them. And forgiveness is not saying what you did is okay. 
It's not saying, I'm just a doormat, do it again. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is simply saying, I'm not going to be connected to what you did. I'm not going to be a part of your bad behavior. I heard a guy say a long time ago, just because somebody's got a bad attitude doesn't mean it's contagious. <laughs> Amen? Just because somebody's got a bad attitude don't mean you've got to catch it. Just because you've got a sour look on your face doesn't mean it's got to jump over on me, right? Right? Just because you made me mad doesn't mean I've got to live there. I can be disconnected from that. Amen? So forgiveness is not the approval of bad behavior. Forgiveness is the Christian's correct response because Christ forgave us. If we do anything else but forgive when someone offends us, we are not being like Christ. Now I know you want to be like Christ. You're at church. You're Christians. That whole thing means being like Christ. It was him who had a nail in his hand, and he says to the guy, he says to God about the guy that drove the nail in his hand, he says, Father, forgive him, for he doesn't know what he's doing. Man, what a challenge that is. Forgiveness also acknowledges our own faults. If you won't forgive somebody, come on, do you really think you're perfect? If you won't forgive somebody, isn't it true that what you're really saying is, I would have never done that, and I've never done anything wrong to anybody? Because you see, when we, when, we, when we won't offer forgiveness to somebody, what we're really saying is, the cross doesn't work. Jesus forgave, because, say this with me, say, Jesus forgives all sins. Jesus, say it again, Jesus forgives all sins. So if I won't forgive, what I'm saying is, God, the God of the universe can forgive you, but what you did to me is worse than what you did to him. And we know that's not true, right? So forgiveness is our correct response. Forgiveness acknowledges our own faults. Forgiveness is removing my judgment and ret retribution and placing it in God's hands. Forgiveness is just saying, you know what? We may not go to coffee all the time. We may not hang out much. But I'm going to love you like God does. And if there's judgment coming, it's not going to come from me. If there's wrath coming, it's not going to be coming for me. Because if, if I do that, then I become God, and that's not what God called me to be, right? Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, we find these words. Bear with each other and forgive any complaint you may have against one another. Forgive, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Everybody go, wow. Come on, say, I can do that. Well, two of y'all can. That's good. Y'all are amazing, man. All right, we'll go through this again. Number two is forgiveness. <laughs> All right, let's go to number three. I'm so glad you're here for number three. I wrote this stuff down a year and a half ago, and it's been in my little notepad, and today I get to share it with you. So number three, the thing that can cause you to disengage from God is love or lust, an ungodly relationship. Now, love, in its truest form, will never cause you to disengage from God. But I have to use the word love because that's what we call lust. In our world today, everything is love. We're in love with everything. We're in love with our car. We're in love with our puppy. We're in love with the hot dogs because we're so hungry. We're in love with him. We're in love with her. Everything is about love. We never use the word love. If we do, it's always in a negative form, but we never feel like we are in lust. And so I want to give you some stuff on that today. But this is one of those things that will cause you to come, become disengaged from God. You will think you're in love, you're truly in lust, and it leads you down the wrong train track. Amen? Amen. I know you don't want to say amen, but anyway. A godly, so, so this is, I'm going to give you the positive side. How do you know if it's a good relationship or a, God, or a bad relationship? A godly relationship will bring you closer to God. If he or she does not bring you closer to God, you need to exit the building. You need to uncouple from that. If he or she pulls you away from God, it is not a godly relationship. It is not love, it is lust. I don't care what he says or what she says. I learned this a long time ago. A guy will say anything to get what he wants. Let me say that again. A guy will say anything to get what he wants, and a girl will do anything to hear what she wants to hear. Some of y'all ought to write that down. A guy will say anything to get what he wants, and a girl will do anything to hear what she wants to hear. 
But a godly relationship will bring you closer to God. I can't tell you how many people I've counseled or heard over the years or just, you know, and, and it's, it's always, you know, uh, I'm going to witness to them. In February, we're going to do a whole thing on dating. But when, when, when somebody tells me, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get them saved. <laughs> and we all chuckle. Girls, let me say something to you. If he won't go to church while you're dating him, he ain't going to show up after the wedding. And hallelujah, that's some good preaching right there. Praise God. <laughs> That'll set somebody free right there. We find ourselves in lower, we lower our standards. We lower our standards because we call it love. And we think, well, you know, it's, it's just this and it's just that. No, if it's lowering your standards, it's not love. Love is always going to bring you up. It's never going to pull you down. God is love. Nothing else says that. Nothing else proclaims to be love. Only God. The enemy has come along with this counterfeit called lust. And as he's come along, he's, he's been so clever because he's renamed his scheme as love. And we get confused because they say they love me. They, they do things that they, they tell me. You know, they're buying me gifts and they're doing these things. But if, if you've had to lower your standard, then it is not a godly relationship. And here's the classic one. But he or she is a Christian. Next time somebody tells me that, just don't you get back of arms because I'm going to slap you. <laughs> but Pastor Gary, he's a Christian. But Pastor Gary, she's a Christian. We are asking the wrong question. We live in America. You're either a Christian or you're an atheist. But even that, you'll probably still say you're a Christian. Everybody in America says they're a Christian. Especially on the dating websites. But he's a Christian. So you ask him, he's a Christian. Yeah, that's what he said, he's a Christian. See, that's the thing, we're asking the wrong question. You need to ask, which church do you serve at? Which church are you involved at? Because everybody says, I'm a Christian. But then you say, where do you go to church? Oh, well, uh, uh, what's the pastor's name? Well, what song did they sing last Sunday? Uh-huh, that's when you find out. Right? Are you a Christian? That's not, that's not even important. That's not even relevant because that's another one of those words. It's important. Don't misunderstand me. But that's another one of those words. We have watered it down so much. We have watered it down so much. Let's just be real. If you're not acting like Jesus, don't call yourself a Christian. This is the thing that has turned sinners against the church is because we say we're Christians, but we're hypocrites with our mouth. We say one thing and we live a completely different life. And then when it's convenient, we throw out our Christian card. Right after we cussed out the officer, right after, right after we made fun of the cashier, right after we didn't tip at our, at our restaurant for lunch because we got to get back at them and show them what a bad waitress looks like, and all these things. We're, we're walking around in judgment, but then saying we're Christians. If he says he's a Christian, then let me tell you something. Ask him what verse he read last night before he went to bed. And that's a lesson for all of us. <laughs> what, if, what if somebody asks you that? What, 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 what Bible app plan are you reading today? Come on, see, if you're, if, you're a, if you're a Christian, you're in the Word. It's not just in Word only. He goes to church, blah, blah, blah. Are you closer to God when you're around them? Let me just say something. God's really speaking to me just these last few months about a men's thing. And, and I think in the first year we're going to start a, a men's program, a men's ministry of some sort. Um, but men, step up. Come on, men. It should be your wife that has to go on Google and find the church that you're going to go to. That's your job. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the, the lady that has to say, can we pray over the food as you've got half a steak down your throat. It should, be, it should be the men that are getting their kids beside the bed and saying, come on, Jimmy, let's pray before we go to sleep. I know nobody names their kid Jimmy anymore, but anyway. Why don't y'all name your next kid Jimmy, just so I can use his name. Yeah, yeah. Come on, little porter. Let's go, let's go, and let's kneel by the bed and pray. That's the man's job. That's the man's job. It's the man's job that says, you know what, we're going to church today. and We're not going to the lake. We're not, it's Sunday. We go to church on Sunday. We go do other things. After. That's the man's job. Well, I'm going to save the rest of that for you for later. So here it is, love or lust. I wrote this about a year and a half ago. I know you can't write all this down. If you want a copy of it, I'll give it to you later. This is how you tell one from the other. Love will enhance all the other relationships in your life. 
that are based in love. Lust will isolate you from truly loving relationships and it only finds comfort in other lustful relationships. Love brings fulfillment in God's plan. Lust removes you from God's plan. Love makes it easy to talk about God, experience God, and include godly activities in the relationship. Lust takes you from God, from His laws and godly activities. Love produces patience to follow God's law. Lust is always in a rush and disregards God's law and even the laws of man all in the name of love. Love, love produces an environment of peace, contentment, and fulfillment. Love, lust produces a fear that it won't last and you need to constantly do things to make it better. Love is self-sustaining. It provides its own, re- own energy for the relationship. Love is, fuel- love is fueled by God. Lust is not sustainable without outside influences. Lust requires more lust to maintain the passion. For people say, married couples say, well, you know, the passion's gone. No, the passion is a result of love. Love is gone. And it's not because she got chubby. It's because you quit loving her. It's not because of this or because of that. It's because you lost your relationship with God. How how can we even expect to have, you know, husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend relationships and have true love if he, the God of love, is not the center of it all? The devil doesn't walk around saying, I am love. No. And let me remind you guys, you ain't love either. You ain't the love shack. You ain't producing love. You're not, yeah, we're in love and we're just going to make love. No, that's not true. You're going to make some lust and some babies. But if you're in love, passion is the result. Hope you still love me. God is love. You can find all of God's characteristics in love. If it doesn't look like God, it's not love. If it doesn't bring peace and joy and fulfillment, if it's not patient, kind, if, it's not, if it doesn't put you first, if it puts everything else first, if you've got to, if you've got to beg her to, you know, anyway. 1 Corinthians 13, God is love. You can find all of God's characteristics in love. Lust is the counterfeit of love and must keep you isolated from love to keep from being exposed. Why is it that in, in relationships, if one of them is really all about lust, why is it they don't want to go to church? It's because to walk in church is to counterfeit. To walk in the presence of God. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to Walmart with Monopoly money. You might be thinking, I, I could maybe convince, maybe you're from another country, and I'm convinced you, man, this is, this is the real deal right here. You got that yellow $5 bill and stuff, you know, you got your orange $500 bill, and you go to Walmart, and you might feel like you got it all together. Until they open that cash drawer and say, this is what a bill looks like, right? Because all of a sudden, the counterfeit is exposed. And so often in life, we don't even know we've been counterfeited. We don't even, in spiritual things, we don't even know that we've lowered our standard. And it's because when we lowered our standard, it uncoupled us from God's plan, and we're out there on our own, and we don't have anything true to relate it to. God comes along and says, but I love you. I love you. Number four. Fourth thing that will cause you to disengage from God. You're going to love this one. Me. Not me. You. Everybody say myself. I will be the one that will cause me to disengage from God's plan. It will be me. It, it could be, you know, I could blame it on lust. I could blame it on this. and I could, But when it all comes down to it, it's the dude looking in the mirror that's the problem. I say this all the time. If, 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 if you can't get along in that job and you can't get along at that job and you can't get along with those people and you go over here and they're picking on you and you go over there and they're picking on you and you go over here and this person doesn't like you, there's a common denominator. It's you. you keep showing up at every catastrophe. Right? Every time there's an argument, it's who happened to be there? You. Amen? We are the ones. It is our own self image. I can, I, I can talk on this. I can be so selfish. Man, we, 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 know, we know us. We know what we like, what we don't like. I, some of y'all haven't gone to eat with me. 
for people that have, you know the frustration. There's a lot of foods I don't like, you know, so to try new things is, is uh, you know, because I'm just like, why would I want to try that? I got to pay money for something that may not be good? I know that chicken fried steak is good. <laughs> Can I get a witness in the house? <laughs> right? Wait, why, why don't they cook the fish? What am I paying them for? That fish is raw. Why would I pay for raw fish? I've got a grill. Cook it. Maybe then I'll try it if it's free. But I'm not going to pay for something that's raw. And I, and, and I may not even like it. It's $12. I'm just cheap, right? Cause, but here's the thing. I know me. I know what I like. I know what I... I, I it doesn't matter what it smells like, what it looks... Well, just taste it a little bit. I can tell by looking at it I'm not going to like it. Right? I mean, pretty much if it's more than one ingredient involved, I'm out. If it's white or whitish colored, I'm done. I mean, it took me forever to even eat white gravy as a kid. I'm like, no, it's just gross. Because I didn't know what was in it, right? I mean, it's just... You go to these restaurants, and you know, they got big... Have you, what is that one that's got like a... It's like an encyclopedia Britannica they pull out. Uh, cheesecake. Che- yeah, see, y'all know, yeah. Cheesecake Factory. Man, you sit down at Cheesecake Factory, you're like... Are you ready to order? Ready to order? I'm on page 27. I don't know yet. I got this much more of the book left, right? It's like a cheesecake factory. My God. It's like every kind of cheesecake known to man and every other food. About three pages in, I'm worn out. I'm just like, you know what? So then when they come, this is what I do at most restaurants. Just bring me this. I want some meat and some potatoes. Do you have a steak? Because they, they know what's meant. They, they're trained, right? They're professionals. I'm going to tip them for helping me figure it out. But I, I, I just know what I want, right? Don't, if I want to have macaroni and cheese, don't try to make something fancy about it. Just bring me macaroni. I live downtown Fort Worth. And there's all these on, on Magnolia. There's all these little fancy restaurants that are just, you know, just give me a taco. I don't know why it's got to be purple chips. Where's a regular chip? You know, because I'm selfish. I know what, because we are all that way. We know what we want. Guacamole. I don't even know why y'all eat that stuff. The core is an avocado. I am out. Just, it's green. I mean, come on, right? Just, this is why, you, you want to you wanna know why I'm trim? It's because of that. My, my foods consist of, I got to go on. My, food, my, my vegetables are candy corn and jelly beans. That's it, man. You eat like, anyway, I got to go on. So we, it's us. We get in the way. And so many times, man, God's like, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I'm just like, eh, I'm not really comfortable with that, God. It's white food. <laughs> well, how many ingredients is in that? I mean, really? You want me to eat that? You know, that, 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 you know spiritually, that's what happens. He's like, well, Gary, you know, what about this? And why don't you do this? And, you know, and he's, maybe it's just me. Sometimes people are difficult, right? And God's like, I need you to love them. I need you to share with them. I need you to talk to them. I'm like, nah, I'm really good. Yeah, just send me, send me what, what I want, right? Let me have the plan that isn't that true. God, I, I'll follow you as long as I can control the plan. We are the ones that will disengage from God's plan because it doesn't fit what we want. We could go back and talk about dating. But God, you know, I'm praying for him. He's going to change. Man, he's 38. He's probably not going to change. I mean, God can change. God can do anything. So let God do it. He don't need your help. You know, you're like, oh, well, I'm here now, so now. No, you're not. You just, you just don't want to be alone. Because it's us. It's us. It's, I, I don't want to work at that place. I want to work at this place. Right? Anyway. Number five. This is a big one too. It's one of these things that we become disengaged from God is when we're upset at God. When we're upset at God. And this is a, you know, I make fun of us being selfish all day long because we're all there. But being upset at God is a real deal. You pray, God doesn't answer the way you thought He should. And before you know it, you've quit praying. Because the last time I prayed, God didn't heal that person. 
God didn't fix my marriage. God didn't save my grandmother from death. And we can easily become disengaged from God because we're upset at Him. That's really the heart of Jonah's story. Jonah wanted those people to be saved, but he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He really wanted God to judge them. And God's plan was a plan of love. Jonah's plan was a, was a plan of judgment. Man, Jonah just became disengaged from God's plan. You know, maybe today, maybe here, maybe there's some of you, you don't even know if God's real. If you're really honest, maybe you, went, you would look back in your childhood and there was a time that you prayed when your parents were going through a divorce. And you said, God, save them, put them back together, and it just didn't happen. And so you gave up on God and you quit praying. Maybe you had a child that was sick and died. I can't imagine that pain. How do you go on from that? God, if you love me, why did this terrible thing happen? And so it's easy to just, just say, well, God, if, if this is how you act to me, I'll do my own thing. I'm just going to go and make it on my own. Jonah's in that well, in his misunderstanding of God, his hurt, his pain. Well, is just constricting his body. It's growing tighter around him. Jonah chapter 2, it even makes reference to seaweed being wrapped around his neck. It's choking the life out of him. The well breaches, and when it does, Jonah grabs a breath of air, and the well dives back down to the depth of the pit of blackness. Some of you know what that pit looks like. Some of you have been in that pit. Some of you are still in that pit. And it pushes in and squeezes you, and you feel like there's no hope and there's no way out. And I can imagine Jonah as he's thinking to himself, how come God didn't just let me die? I thought, I, I, I know I've done the wrong thing and I know I've turned my back on God. How come now he's even torturing me even more as the well squeezes? As he feels his skin begin to burn the acid from that well's digestive tract. If he could see, he would see the wrinkles in his hand are the worst they've ever been. If he could open his eyes and see what was going on, the fear that would grasp, grasp his heart, but the, pit, the pitch black darkness is, he doesn't realize it, but if anything, it's the grace of God. Sometimes terrible things will put you in a place of depression. And you think, man, I'm never going to get out of this. What you may not realize about depression is depression is also a safety thing from God. Did you know that when you're going through divorce, when you're going through death, grief, that the emotional stress that it takes on your body takes 85% of your energy? And so you're having to work, you're having to eat, dress, everything else on the 15% that remains. And God has allowed for your body to shut down in those times. We clinically call that, we don't, people call that depression. Now, clinical depression that lasts for months on end is definitely not a good thing. But even depression, when you know how much God loves you, is this shelter that He puts you in to hold you, to keep you from everything else. The reason you're so tired is because if you were to leave your house, you would get hurt and wounded even worse. And so He holds you close. Poor Jonah, he's in this well. He thinks his life is done. Can you imagine the mental things that are going through his mind? Man, if I'd have just done what God said. All the what ifs, all the regret, all the man, I've got to do better, but I, I have no way out. This is just, why can't I just drown? Why do I have to go through this? And some of us in this room today are in those situations that life is pushing and the pressure is there and it just seems like there's no hope and no way out. But I've got word for you, God still has a plan. 
The story of Jonah is not a story of judgment. There are elements, and if you're religious, that's all you'll see. Well, Jonah messed up, and this is what happens when you mess up. But there is another story in there. There's another deeper story, and it's the story of love. It's the story of a God that sees a guy going the wrong way. And he sees a guy that's turned his back on him. And he sees Jonah, his prophet. He sees him making some terrible decisions. And God says, you know what? I'm going to send a storm. And that storm stops the, stops the boat. And Jonah finds himself in the, in the sea. And then he finds himself in the belly of a well. And it's not God's judgment. It is still the plan of God. Because God sent the fish. And God is directing the fish where Jonah was supposed to go in the first place. (laughs) Three days later, after being in this well, the Bible says God caused the fish to vomit him up on the shore. There's historical evidence of this town of Nineveh that they worshipped the sea. They had turned their back on the God, the Yahweh. They had turned their back on the Jehovah God, and they began to worship the God of the sea. Because <laughs> you see, you see, <laughs> God always has a plan. And so on this one day, this man is spit out of the mouth of a fish on the beach of a town who worships sea God. And this man stands on the beach stark naked. His skin is as white as a ghost because of what happened to him being almost digested by a whale. He's covered in mucus and no telling what. And the words he speaks out of his mouth changes them forever. As Jonah says, repent. The Bible says that the entire city came to God. Every single person heard of this man named Jonah. They heard that even the well spit him back out. They heard that the God of the universe, not their God that ran the sea, but the God of the universe brought him in a, in a instead of a ship, brought him in a to tell them to repent. And so the entire city got saved. And you have no idea what God's plan is for you. I have no idea the depths God will take me for His plan for me. What I do know and what I'm sharing with you today, I have to stay engaged. I got to get my Bible open. I got to start finding time to pray i got to make room in my life for the king of the universe. Would you stand with me today? Just bow your head. Close your eyes. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know him? Not as the storybook version But have you met him? Have you surrendered your life to him? Man, this is the day to start fresh. This is the day for new beginnings. When I say that in this room, I'm speaking to the people that have come to church here for almost 10 years now. Do you know him? Have you surrendered your life to him? Are you connected to Him? The God of love. The God that took a rebellious son and still brought a plan to to pass in His life. Do you know Him? One of the last things we talked about today is being upset at God maybe you've gone through situations that you feel like God let you down like Ryan said earlier give him a shot give him another shot give him another chance
you to just, as you're standing with your heads bowed, just in your own words, just say, God, I'm coming back to you. God, I'm starting fresh and new. Maybe there's love, lust relationships in your life. Maybe right now you need to make a commitment to walk away from those things. Maybe there's people in your life that you have unforgiveness toward. It's time right now to make your mind up to forgive them. You're just upset at God, or maybe you just realize, man, I'm the problem. We're going to pray here in just a second, and this is a real simple prayer. It's just just us coming back to God. And as we pray this, I want you to listen to the words I'm saying. Take your time, and I want you to repeat these words with me. Everybody in this room, we're just going to all start fresh and new. So I'm going to take this slow, but you can think about what you're saying. We'll repeat this after me and repeat it, everyone in the room, out loud so you can hear your own voice. And man, if you mean this, it will change your life. Here we go. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I'm a mess. Forgive me. I've become disengaged from you. But today, I want to re-engage. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my plan that has taken me away from your plan. I choose today to follow you with my whole life. I'm engaging with you today change me make me more like you in Jesus name